let's start. Okay, so again, I, I think uh, obviously we're in some interesting times at this point. And, um, you know, and I do appreciate everybody who has joined. Uh, it's this is uh, if you haven't seen me kind of walk through all these numbers, I mean, it's uh, it's it's pretty unique on what we're going through from a uh, you know from an industry perspective. And again, overall basis, I think the industry has done a really good job um, with dealing with fires. And and you know over the past five years, they've really done a lot of different things to um, to help uh, this um, you know to help this problem. But again, I think what I'm going to do today is kind of walk through. I'm, I'm doing a little differently. What I'm going to do is really walk through how many fires that we have seen and really focus specifically on March numbers as well and uh, talk about all the issues that we're dealing with right now from a coronavirus perspective. And again, I'm not doing this just to kind of throw out, hey, you know, there are fires because of coronavirus, but I think we're seeing so many different trends that I'll get into later. Um, and then I, I have a, an article that's coming out tomorrow. So it'll, it'll really like dive deep into all the different trends that we're going to see kind of moving up. Normally, April and March um, or March and April are not big months for us. And, you know, this March, we didn't see a big month. So, you know, when we look at it, though, when I started digging into the numbers, we had more waste fires than we've had of any other type of fire. Um, so I went back over the past four years and kind of looked at the data. And I really actually believe that over the next 90 days, we're going to see, I mean, this is unforeseen, right? So, um, I'm going to get into that. And then, of course, we'll get into consequences. Of course, we'll get into, um, you know, we'll get into, you know, how our fire rover solution works. And I'll show you a ton of videos. But I think the real issue that we're seeing right now is we are going to see, or at least my opinion is that we're going to see a, a significant amount of fires that are going to come into waste transfer stations. Right. And so with that being said, most of these fires, you know, the 339 are made up of scrap um, electronics. Um, you know, uh, chemicals, you know, and all the different, uh, you know, rubber, um, organics as well. So let's kind of walk through this. Um, I will, I mean, I'll keep this open for questions. So please, if you want to chat questions or if you want to, you know, interrupt me, feel free. Um, but so what I'm going to do first is that, so basically for anyone who's, who's never seen me kind of speak, I do a report that is waste and recycling reported facility fires. And again, these are reported. So let me be clear as well. At Fire Rover, we have a front row seat into seeing all these fires as they happen or as they occur. Um, and a lot of these were, most of these, knock on wood, are being put out as well. I don't include any of those in this. So we have actually seen an increase of fires, and I'll show you one or two of those that we've seen happen over the past two weeks. But we've seen an increase in um, fires based on what I'm going to show you as those trends. Um, so again, as we look at these, these are reported fires. These have to be reported in media. Um, and I, I've been doing this since uh, February of 2016. So, you know, again, we, we have seen months where um, March, April, May, June, that we, we saw huge increases. But this big increase when we went through it was really scrap metal. And I think the big issue that we're going to see now is all waste and or it's it's really waste and it's it's outside of recycling. So if anyone has any input or feedback on this, um, I'm happy to um, you know happy to uh, have you guys speak as well. Um, but what I'm going to do this is the uh, last year's data. So these were 343 reported fires that we've seen in the last year. Um, with that, I extrapolate that there's 1,800 facility fires that do occur. And those are the fires that you don't see, right? Those are the ones that it's a lithium ion battery on a floor, on a tip floor, and it's put out right away. Um, it's not big enough to be reported. The 349 fires are typically large enough that, they're, that they are reported by media. So they have to either, A, they need to be in a location where the, the media is reporting. So, you know, there's a lot less fires theoretically in Texas versus California. But with that being said, Texas has less reporting of fires based on, you know, the fact that some of these fires happen and, and they're just not affected. So nobody knows that they're even happening. Um, so that's really the hidden piece of this. Um, the 1800 number, or the 1800 numbers, I won't get too in detail because a lot of people have seen this, but that number is based on um, reported fires in similar areas like the UK um, as well as some others. Um, this is broken out by material. 
So again, when we look at it, waste is definitely the, the biggest piece of fires. What I've been trying to do lately is take waste, paper, and plastics, and I put them all in together because there's a lot of plants that are hybrid. So you might have a transfer station, but you're going to have a MRF that does some sort of a cardboard recycling. And, you know, so really, you know, we're seeing a ton more hybrid operations out there. So I look at it more from the footprint of how they happen. Waste, paper, and plastics typically is coming from a consumer versus the metal um, C and D and rubber where, you know, the consumer can do something about not putting the wrong things into their recycling or into their waste, right? The same thing with metals and, um, and C and D and electronics recycling, we know the hazards as they're coming in. Um, at, at least we have a better chance of going through and, and stopping those hazards before they get in. Now, again, with C and D, if for some reason a, a building would, you know, burns down, then you really don't have the ability to pull out the lithium ion batteries or the computers or anything else that's going to cause hazards. But in, you know, if you're doing a, a typical demolition, you can remove all of those before they get into the, uh, the stream. So if we're looking at it, scope of the problem, um, this is my fire incidences that I've been reporting. And then this was Nathan Bernard um, from the Insurance Association of America. These are actual claims data um, from the top five insurers. And again, we'll get into a little bit of this, but obviously insurers are, are nervous. Um, I think 2018 was a reflection point for insurers. I think they are looking to, um, um, they are looking to, you know, understand and looking at how to mitigate risk. So, you know, fortunately for Fire Rover, I spent a ton of my time and, you know, Lindsay and my other partners, we spent a ton of, ton of our time trying to um, work with insurance companies and we're bringing them back into the industry, trying to show them that the risk can be mitigated through a lot of different things. And again, Fire Rover is not the only solution to the problem. I'll get into what I think the solution is, but, but you know, the big piece of this is proper fire planning as well as our solutions, a piece of that. So I don't want you guys to think that I'm doing this just to basically say, hey, if you don't do Fire Rover, you know, there, you have no chance of um, getting good insurance rates. Um, again, this is a worldwide problem. Um, you know, so we're seeing again in Japan, this is all in 2018. And this really gets to um, the increase in fires that we're seeing based in the proliferation, I can't even say the right word, right word but the proliferation, and again, I screwed it up, but the uh, basically we're seeing a big amount of fires that have been increasing and across the world, it really is 18 as the inflection point. Um, so when I look at it, the, the whole kind of concept that 40% of waste and recycling facilities in the USA have experienced a fire in 2019, um, you know, 7% of these are documented and reported. I mean, we, I have access an individual into a lot of fires that happen. So again, in our role, I can, we can see a ton of these fires as we put them out. Um, but we, you know, I also just based on the role that I've been in, I, you know, I get forwarded a lot of fires that do happen that aren't reported. And again, I'm very clear not to report those um, as well. So someone just asked me if I could put it into presentation mode. So I will do that. Hold on one sec. All right. I have it. It's kind of hidden a little bit, but yeah, let me pull it here. Okay, here we go. I hope that helps. And with the data. And again, if you want to see this um, after, we'll, we'll be able to, um, is everybody seeing okay? If you can't see it, let me know. Um, and the reason I have it outside of presentation mode, and you guys will see later as I'm doing the videos, um, I have to have it outside of presentation mode to really stop and start the videos because some of them take a little bit longer, but I'll keep it like this in the beginning. Um, now, again, I just got asked a question, like what needs to be done to increase the likelihood that a fire is reported? And again, I think it's one of those things that we don't have a, a, an, an entity that regulates whether there are fires inside our facility. So a lot of it is currently self-regulation. And again, a lot of these fires happen where, you know, you might have a small fire, a loader gets in, it puts it out, 
or, you know, so there's, there's a ton of different things that happen. If you had to report every single one, um, you know, it would definitely be arduous, but at the same time, I mean, you know, I think the real reason that you see it in like the UK is because they have an agency that requires that they, um, you know, that they show all the fires. And again, I still think their numbers are, are smaller. They leave it to, um, larger size fires, right? If an incident doesn't actually happen, does it really happen? And I think that's where, you know, if you put a fire out within seconds or a loader goes in and basically takes a fire out of a tip floor, you know, relatively quickly, then, you know, it's really a non-incident. Um, it's the big fires that actually turn into um, ones that need to be reported. So again, is this number real? And, and uh, you know, I, I'm happy to share this as well. Um, no problem, Andy. So, you know, is this number real? In the UK, we're looking at firms affected by waste fires, you know, two to three or two thirds have said yes. Length of disruption, and this is why I like to show the slide, is that typically when you see a fire, um, they're not small because, again, the small ones aren't really reported. So the ones that are reported, I mean, you know, length of disruption is minimal a day. So this becomes a big, you know, this is a safety issue. Um, you know, this is definitely a, uh, a, a continuity of business issue, right? If I can put a fire out relatively quickly, or if I can prevent a fire from happening, I stay in business. Now, again, of course, your employees need to be safe. And of course, you know, you're, you're looking from an insurance perspective and, and all the different things. But really, the big issue is, is that you don't want to be down. So if you can figure out a way to put fires out quickly, then you can definitely be down. Um, so this was the numbers from last year. And again, you know, I'm looking at it from a waste perspective, a metal perspective. Like last, in 2018, we did see a huge spike in uh, metal fires. And that's where, um, that's what I had showed you guys before from, you know, that big spike on the, uh, the, the major chart with all the reported fires over the last four years. Um, now, again, this breaks everything down. And, and this is in my, I, I did do an annual report, and I'm more than happy to send that. And I'll show you guys, um, most of you have my email as well. It, just feel free to reach out and I can send you a PDF of that. Um, and it has all these, this data in it. Um, this is what I was talking about when I broke everything down into waste, paper, and plastics, put that all into one, right? And then metal, C and D and electronics. And I think, you know, again, just to get into the reason I did that from when I see a fire that's reported, a lot of times it, they might say, hey, it's cardboard, but it's inside a transfer station because they're collecting the cardboard at the transfer station. So you know, it's not clear to figure out exactly what causes these. And I think as we're like, as I'm seeing them, I don't want to be incorrect, right? So my feeling is when I take waste, paper fires, plastic fires, put them together, um, it becomes more of an MSW curbside issue, again, versus the metal C and D and electronics, right? Electronics aren't you and I dropping electronics off, it's typically you and I dropping them off to a Home Depot, who now takes them to your final, um, you know, your, your, your final recycler. And, you know, there's a number of recyclers out there. And those fire issues are completely different and unique to the fires that we see in tip floors and other things or in and other waste paper plastic issues. Um, now, again, organics, that's typically food or mulch or any sort of, you know, something that was once living. Uh, and then chemicals, you know, it's, it's chemical recycling. We do see, you know, a ton of fires there. And then rubber as well, where you know, we, we do in rubber when there's a fire, it's typically a really bad one. So with that, I basically broke out, um, you know, the fires, like showing that for years it was always waste. And it's funny, scrap metal fires went up, but waste fires still went up. Um, you know, so again, I will say as an industry, we have for the past five years really changed from if you walked in in 2015 in waste and recycling industry and you look today. I mean, we have like there has been so much change and so much focus put on uh, prevention of fires, right? And and planning and all the different things. I think most most companies are doing the right thing now, but we still have fires, right? And we're still having growth in fires. So what that shows me is that you know I put out two, over 200 fires in the last 12 months, and we're still having increases. So again, that kind of plays to. Um, that kind of plays to the to the the example and, and how badly things are potentially could go. Um, so let's get into so so this I broke out reported fires uh, by material over year. Again, it's just another way to look at it. But you know, let me get into and and all this data. It's by state, so I know there's a there's a ton. You know, Aaron, I know you're with Michigan, and um, you know, I, I believe uh, the EPA. So I, I'm sure there's 
um, some folks from Minnesota, as well as uh, some of the other five states. And I, I don't want to gloss over these, but there are specific issues, and I'm happy to have a different conversation with you. Um, but this is all in my in my annual report. So it really breaks out recycling affected by state, um, looking at the population, looking at tonnage reported, using EREPS data to say, okay, how many fires are you having per tons that are actually processed? So all these things I can and break into them. And again, what's causing all these fires overall and take out, you know, what we're dealing with today, um, you know, with the stay at home orders and others, you know, it's, it's hot and dry environments. Um, we see different fires, um, a different fire path from, you know, Florida versus, um, you know, North America or, um, you know, Northern U.S., right? Florida's drier during the, the winters. And, you know, so that's when they have a, a significant number of their fires versus um, other areas that are opposite. So, you know, that's definitely an issue. I mean, the, the China recycling restrictions, again, I mean, this has been on for a little bit of time. The major issue really, I mean, uh, Sparks, Hot Works, and then really, um, you know, we have all these traditional hazards, but the major issue that we are dealing with is that, um, is someone not seeing the slide that what's causing the increase in fires? Is that, are you guys seeing that? Okay, let me try this again. Oops, stuck on slide 11. So let's go back. So you guys didn't see all these slides. Oh man. All right. Can you see, can you see now? Okay. Well, so let, let me do this. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller if that's okay. And then hopefully this is big enough for that. You guys can see it. Um, but this usually will fix the problem. So, okay. So, what I was showing you before was what's causing the increase in fires. Um, Chris, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. So I hope this works. I mean, this is typically, uh, you know, so again, what's causing these? And again, I think the major thing that we're seeing are lithium ion batteries at the purple light, And again, it got me. Yeah. <laughs> Either way. Yeah. So, you know, you look at the amount of lithium ion batteries that are getting into the industry. I mean, it's or getting into the waste and recycling stream. And, you know, it's uh, it's just it's a problem that's not going away anytime soon. Um, I did a um, I spoke with a, uh, you know, one of the um, engineers from one of our major laboratories. And, you know, again, they kind of alluded to the fact that the reason that we see in the newspaper or in you know media the reason we see so many of these articles that are like, hey, water-based something will change the world and it's going to be the new you know, energy storage solution that replaces this issue is that they need funding, right? So they have to have some wins. But really, at the end of the day, the reality is, is that lithium-ion batteries are a very safe product, right? They work very well. I mean, you only have like, it's like one in a million that you have issues with from manufacturing until it's used. It's just when they are mishandled is when you have issues. And again, what happens in waste and recycling? We're not gentle with our trash. We mishandle our lithium ion batteries because that's part of the business, right? Um, so, you know, we need education of the public, but again, you know, education can only go so fast and um, all the different pieces can only go so fast because, you know, we're adding billions and billions of these things a year. You know, I love to show the um, I don't know if everyone can see this, but, you know, I love to show the the uh, the example of the iPad or the uh, earbuds, right? There's three lithium ion batteries in a set of earbuds and, you know, Apple's making, I think it was a billion of these things, you know, over the next 10 years. So that's three billion batteries that are just coming from these. Um, so now let's get into like some of the fun. All right. So basically when I'm looking at what's happening now, right, as we're sitting here, and, you know, we're seeing a virus that has now basically required a majority of the United States um, is under quarantine. So what's actually happening and how is this affecting waste and recycling? And again, I do understand that because a lot of our businesses are shut down, there's a lot of tonnage that has been 
pulled out of the commercial stream, but a lot of that tonnage from restaurants and others, but a lot of that tonnage is, is moving in other directions. So when I started looking at the, the 18 fires that I saw for this year, if we look at these numbers, right? So basically, normally compared to March of the last four years um, of 16, 17, 18, and 19, I kind of broke out what the material costs were. And normally we see about 45% that are waste, plastic, and paper. Um, we're seeing about 56% now. And this this year, it was I believe it was 10 fires that occurred, and it was all waste. There was no paper. There was no plastic. So then we start to look at it, and, and you know, there's we start to look at what's really causing this, right? So the number of March overall fires was down, um, or at least normalized at 18. But then when you're looking at all the averages and you're trying to understand that this made up more waste fires, you know, that's an issue, right? And again, the fires that we're seeing that we're putting out, we're still seeing scrap metal fires and we're still putting out other fires. But a big piece of this is um, it's, it's focused on, on the, uh, the transfer stations. And that's really where we're seeing a lot of it. And so basically, my belief is this. As we look at trends, typically we see a summer trend and then typically we see a retail trend. So the first thing is, is that normally we have, um, you know, two things, right? One, we had a Christmas, right? So basically we just went through the last three weeks of, you know, everybody hoarding and we bought more material and things to get prepared for the fact that we're at our house, whether it was TVs and boxes and ordering. I mean, we literally cleaned out shelves and retail and, you know, we did all these different things, which was similar to me to what happens in Christmas when we see a ton of fires actually start after Christmas Day up until um, up until January, right? So, you know, did we just go through the theoretical Christmas, um, you know, trend because of all of the consumer buying that was happening? Okay, then you add into it school closures, right? And we haven't seen school closures yet, but there's 132,000 schools in the United States. A lot of these schools have closed down kids have left their lockers full, right? I mean, you know, so a lot of them were not allowed to go back to their schools. So when is that going to get cleaned out? So over the next 60 days, we're going to have, think the, the difference of having all of the students clean out their lockers to having a janitor that needs to go through every single locker, throw all the, you know, all the toys and the trinkets and all these things that these kids are playing with that they're throwing in that have lithium ion batteries inside. That all goes to trash. None of it gets taken. None of it gets recycled. None of it goes to Home Depot drop-off points, all those different pieces. Then you, you get like, it, it was the 100-year spring cleaning this year, right? So normally spring cleaning happens in a month, right? But this year it happened early. And then not only was it a spring cleaning, but this was like a 100-year spring cleaning, right? I mean, I don't know about everybody else, but you know, there's memes abound, you know, abound that are out there. But really the idea is that People cleaned, like they didn't just kind of clean their closets. They cleaned their closets, their basements, their garages, their attics. I mean, you know, and we're still going through that right now, especially with the, with the, you know, with the amount of um, people that are in their homes, right? So it's the hundred year spring cleaning, right? Those boxes that are filled with all your old uh, computers and everything. Now, the biggest issue is that if you are an, an educated consumer, and you're, you know, an educated public and you understand that, hey, I shouldn't throw my old iPhone and this box of every single lithium ion battery I've had for the last eight years into the trash, I should recycle it. Well, number one, you don't want the it to go into your curbside recycling. You want to recycle it effectively so that it goes into an electronic recycler. Issue there, right, is that a lot of these electronic recycling drop-offs have been stopped. And then also you're, you're stuck at home. So what ends up happening with your paint, your gasoline, your chemicals, your lithium ion batteries and all the different things. So we're seeing like I'm I'm seeing my belief is, is that that's what's going to cause um, a significant amount of issues, you know, inside our waste stream. And again, this is focused on waste stream. So, you know, as we look into our curbside bins, as we look into cleaning, we're also seeing a lot of recycling programs in municipalities across the country that have slowed down as well or been turned off during this time. So again, what happens? Instead of putting in a recycling, it now all goes into our trash and all those hazards that we've seen in recycling now literally are focused through on a curbside, you know, um, trash piece. So again, you know, 
I'm sure there are other trends that we're going to see. For me, the next 60, 90 days is really looking at this. I think we're already seeing it. March being a slowdown because really March slowed down because there was a lot of confusion. You know, we didn't know a lot of people were, were you know, didn't know how far apart you needed to be and all the different things as, as we continue to fight these. So, again, you know, it, this is definitely something that's unprecedented for us to be looking at. Um, so with that, does anyone have any questions about that or thoughts that they would like to share? Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's get on to like consequences, fire planning and solutions. And again, this is where the fun kind of comes in. Um, you know, I shouldn't say fun because we're dealing now with consequences. So um, this is the not fun part. This was actually last year. Um, with injuries, we saw a rash of injuries. Um, I believe it's 50 in the last 12 months, which would be March that was reported yesterday. But, you know, we were looking at 49 different inju injuries and, uh, you know, in 18, there were only 19. So again, these are reported injuries to, through the, uh, media. This is not reported through any agency. These are through the media. So, you know, the other thing is we're looking at about two deaths a year. And, um, you know, I know Dave Biederman's on the phone. I know we've shared, you know, with what those are when we see them. I mean, they're horrible. You know, they're not, you know, most of the injuries are to fire professionals when they're fighting these during the summer. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, there, there's definitely any sort of injury is, is something that you don't ever want to have happen. And I think I broke this down by the number of incidences. So, you know, kind of looking at that and looking at other pieces. Um, now, to kind of move on from that, you know, because I, I don't think right now that's what we're, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen this month alone, I didn't see any injuries whatsoever. So knock on wood on that one. Um, but I think, you know, the consequences are the insurance companies, right? They're, they're leaving at crazy pace, right? So, you know, over the past, four, or uh, over the past five years, I mean, we really saw again, when I told you that 18 was an inflection point, you know, you see in Japan, the numbers went from what, 30 fires to 132 fires, right? Well, this is where they started seeing it. So, you know, I remember in 16 and 15, I'm being told, hey, you know, you have the, like, I'm, I was warning people that lithium ion battery was coming, um, the issues. But again, you know, it didn't really start to hit. The insurance companies were going to find out about it, right? And again, this was, you know, Nathan's data as well, which has the reported fires from shredders and lithium ion batteries. 18 was the big year, and these were actual claims. Right. And so, again, when you look at a shredder fire, a lot of shredders or in thieves, if, if that's what they're classifying them as, um, you know, those are part of a uh, lithium ion battery increase. And again, you know, this is what, you know, and then obviously lithium ion batteries in themselves. This is what got the insurance companies going crazy. Not anybody, any media talking about it. They had no idea about it. Right. They only care when they started seeing the claims come in. And they have to write a $75 million check for a waste energy facility or a $30 million check for, you know, a, a MRF. And they're scared, right? They're thinking, why are we doing this? Again, it's, it's, a, it's a dollars and cents thing for them. So with that being said, you know, and I won't get into it in full. I, I don't know if John Shoemaker's on the call as well. And I'm, I'm sure there's some other insurers. But the renewal expectations and what we're seeing from a fire rover perspective is that until they go up for renewal, you know, your waste and recycling facilities are typically okay. Once they go up for renewal, what we're seeing is that if they have a fleet, right, then it's easier to get property insurance. But if you're running recycling or waste without a fleet, so, you know, you basically, you can't walk in and say, hey, I have 100 trucks that, that are worth half a million a piece. Now will you also, you know, bring in my property insurance um, and give me a good rate on it? Well, if you're going in just to get that property insurance and you don't have anything to offset that, you know, we're starting to see bigger issues. Um, a lot of the companies are now taking layers of, um, of risk. So, you know, they'll eat 10% and you need four or five companies to come together to, to get layered risk. And, you know, again, that's something that, you know, um, it, there, there's others who can talk better about that as I can. So really, you know, at this point, okay, we know there's an issue. Um, there's an inherent risk of fire in our daily operations, waste and recycling. So what do we need to do? And it's really preparing a fire safety plan. And again, I know ISRI just came out with um, some recommended practices. And, and really, um, there's a lot of different, you know, organizations out there that have come out with some recommended practices. I know SWANA and Waste to Energy and others. And again, I don't care what the recommended practices are. I'm never going to say, hey, this isn't right. This is right. 
I do spend a lot of time working with fire engineers. Um, I've developed one called the uh, Combinational Approach to Firefighting with Jim, em Jim Emerson, who's a fire engineer from one of the large insurance companies. But again, th the idea is you need to plan, right? If you're doing nothing, that's the problem. If you're doing something, then chances are you're doing something that's going to help from a prevention perspective. Nobody can forecast the future. So, you know, if you solve a problem in one area of your facility, that doesn't mean that a fire doesn't start in another area and all, you know, and vice versa. So really the idea of sitting down and doing an audit of your facility and looking at it from a like a risk mitigation perspective, like your insurance company is going to do someone like Jim Emerson coming on site, looking at it, auditing it to make sure that, hey, you know, good operators have less fires. and. That's true. We're all going to have fires. Good operators have less fires. Bad operators have more fires. Um, you know, that's something that, you know, we can basically kind of, you know, hold as a uh, hold as true. So, again, the fire safety plan, therefore, covers all fire prevention, evacuation and emergency response. So, you know, the whole idea is um, when I look at fires and, and I won't get into the specifics of these, um, you know, this is something that. I've, I've published and, you know, it's actually in the annual report and it has, you know, Jim Emerson in my version. But again, as long as you have a plan, that's good. I think what we do or, or what I've really been spending my time on is if you look at from an NFPA perspective, if you look at a, the fire industry and fortunately, I get to spend a lot of time outside of waste and recycling. I get to understand really what's going on in a fire prevention perspective. and the internal response time is where we see the greatest potential, um, the greatest potential um, innovation or place for innovation. So if you look at prevention, you know, the goal of prevention is to minimize the number of combustible events. So it's to do everything you can to plan, right? And professional response is, hey, work with your fire department, make sure that, you know, you might have the tools on site. So if you roll the hoses out for them, they are on site, they're going to fight, or better chance that they're going to fight. If you have their equipment ready for them, there's a better chance they're going to fight. If they're familiar with your operation, then there's a better chance they're going to fight your fire. If you're not, there's a better chance they're going to let your building burn down, right? Um, in the middle of the night, do they come and do you have a, a lock on the front door, or do you have it so that the fire department knows exactly how to get in? You know, so are you prepared for that professional response or the fire brigade? But really, for us, the real opportunity is that internal response. How fast can I detect the fire, right? Number one, when you look at it, it's how fast can I detect a fire from if I can catch it, A, before there's a flame, which we can do sometimes. ASR pile is a perfect example of things that we can do. We can look at preventive maintenance from equipment, looking at it from a thermal perspective. If we can set a fire, in the old days, they looked at incipient stage. We have the ability to potentially catch fires in the pre-incipient state. If we catch a heat trend in a rubber fire or in a, in a rubber pile that's deep-seated, can we catch it early enough that, you know, this could have been burning for seven days or been reacting for seven days before we see a major fire? So the idea is, can we set that tripwire earlier in the process as possible? Then once you have a fire, how fast can we react, right? And I think a lot of people think that our system, like, needs to basically there's a huge explosion and we have to go at it and go at it and go at it and go at it. But typically, you know, we, we are shooting for 12 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute at the most, right? Now, again, there are deep seated fires and I can show you those, but you know, really at the end of the day, the goal for us is to catch a fire at any stage. We know there are not, we know there are going to be fires, right? Anybody who's going to tell you that you're going to have a hundred percent prevention of fires in waste and recycling, they're honestly like, I mean, I'd probably look to have them committed. Um, you know, but the goal is not to have a major fire incident that gets reported by the media. Um, and again, not because of the case that it gets reported, but that it gets big enough that they, the, the fire department comes in and does containment. So really what we do is we use a thermal camera, right? We use top grade military cameras. We trend heat. When we see an abnormality, we, it goes back to our central station. It's a UL certified facility. We have our, our agents are highly trained. They look, the biggest piece of what they do is clear false alarms, and they're clearing false alarms all day, right? False positive. Hey, looks like there's a fire. No, actually, that alarm is a forklift that just went by. That alarm is a truck that just went by. That alarm is something that's not a fire. When there is a fire, you know, there's we have a box that sits on site. 
It's a 20 by 8 by 8 container. So this was actually at Waste Expo last year. And hopefully, um, you know, we will have it at Waste Expo. Hopefully that it will happen um, in New Orleans as well. But so basically, the it's a 20 by 8 by 8 container. We use internet and we use electricity. If you're outdoors, there's, you know, we can put up to a 22 foot mast. And, you know, this can be put in the middle. It's heated and it's cooled. So it can be put in the middle of nowhere. It can be put, you know, under um, or it can be put inside a scrap metal facility or or outside a scrap metal facility around the shredder or around um, paper facilities around their storage. And then um, we have a thousand gallon tank. Typically, we use a three percent of an encapsulator agent, which is a cooling wetting agent, environmentally friendly. Um, you know, it doesn't need cleanup, but then we do. So half of our installs are this unit will sit outside and we'll custom plumb them inside. So if you think um, 30, 40, 50 foot ceiling, we're coming out and all you're going to see in your ceiling is a camera and a nozzle. So this will give you an example right in here. I know it's small, but literally that's all you're going to see inside your building. So we're out of the way, you know, so if you think about our protection and what we do differently. If you look at a sprinkler system, which NFPA mandates sprinkler systems, um, we actually now have our system in replace in jurisdictions in, as a sprinkler system in a couple different areas. One is in lithium ion battery storage, lithium ion battery uh, collection, and then we also have uh, MRFs and transfer stations. And the reason we have this is that if you think of a sprinkler system, they were not created to do the initial um, you know, to, to do the initial extinguishment or final extinguishment. They're there to contain. So especially when you're dealing like a sprinkler system is great when you're dealing with a 30 foot build or a 30 story, um, you know, high building, or if you're dealing with um, you know, office spaces or smaller areas. But when you have a 40 to 50 foot ceiling and you have an open area in an industrial um, application or industrial building, like most MRFs, transfer stations, C&D facilities, indoor scrap, I mean, most of us are set up this way. Um, we have line of sight so that thermal detection can work. And the other issue is, is that the sprinkler heads have to be so high because they have to not be in the way of all of the, the activity that's happening on the floor. So with that being said, you end up you know, by the time the radiant temperature gets hot enough, and again, think your dock doors are open, it's the middle of winter, it's blowing in cold air, and you have a fire, well, think about how big that fire has to be for that tincture inside the sprinkler head to hit 180 degrees to actually go off, right? So take that out of the equation, and it's, it's ours is we see it in its, in its specific state, and we shoot it and cool it. Um, one of the things that we've done now is that, you know, we've actually expanded the types of solutions that we offer. We have a thermal only. We have the fire rover solution as a fire rover tank. We have the sprinkler replacement. This is, so we just finished a, um, for one of the large automotive OEMs. So basically it's storage of lithium ion batteries. Um, and what, what it, so basically it has our system, but the, the uh, IF, IFA, the International Fire Association, has just made it so that most, or they've just provided a recommendation for fire professionals to take a defensive approach to um, any time they're fighting a fire that's in a, a, a building that recycles lithium ion batteries or has a lithium ion battery. This all came from, there was a huge incident in Arizona where a bunch of firefighters were injured and, and hurt um, from an explosion inside a lithium ion battery. And again, we all know that if you're going to put a lithium ion battery fire out, really the idea is, is that you need to contain the area around it and not have thermal runoff or ther thermal runaway. So what we've done is, is that we'll, we'll shoot for this location. We have three boxes around the location, and then we have a manifold off the back that the fire department can connect to. So when the fire department gets there at the eight to 12 minutes, when we're extinguished of our tank, they can connect to the uh, to the back, and we'll continuously shoot out of our solution for as long as we can, targeted towards the actual heat, which is exactly what we need to do. And I'll show you some of those videos as well. So the other thing that we're doing now is the fire rover Deleuze system, where if you look at waste to energy facilities, for example, you know it doesn't make sense to have a fire rover tank. What you're trying to do is really Deleuze the system because you might have trash that's 20 to 70 feet high. And when I say 70 feet high, if you've ever been to a waste to energy facility, like 
I'm not exaggerating. It's 70 feet high. So what you're doing is you need a deluge system that's targeted. These places fill with smoke relatively quickly. Um, and with that being said, so we, we will tie into the existing plumbing infrastructure and we have our monitors and our detection and all the different pieces that can allow, you know, safely to go after and to lose that system. So the minute that it turns on, it will literally go until we have it completely soaked, which is the, the purpose of, of what we're doing in, in these types of solutions. So again, what you're going to see here, this is, uh, this is the uh, encapsulator agent that we use. I mean, you know, it, it's amazing stuff, right? I mean, we're basically, this is Pete. He's crazy. I would never do this, but I mean, apparently I've seen Pete a number of times. I think you've all seen him and he's still there and his hand still works very well. So um, this is how the solution works, right? And what you're going to see is that, you know, our, this is basically what our agents will look at. They have a joystick on their desk computer they're looking at you know four different boxes one is of the tank pressure um, we have with every thermal camera that we install we have depth cameras so we have a, a nozzle cam and a, a, another camera what we'll call it an anchor cam for depth and so when we see a fire we're going to go in this is where the fun part starts so this is uh this is one of the demos that we did so that didn't have fires in it. Typically we have fires, but he wanted to control them himself. And so what you're going to see is we can shoot these and then also it's going to come back. And someone just asked, are these UL listed agents for the foams? Well, so again, there's, there's different foams out there, right? There are foams that are UL listed, um, but they have fluorine in them. Um, we use an encapsulator agent that's not, as you see here, this is how far it's shooting. It shoots about 150 feet um, when we're shooting from a, uh, you know, from a, um, an outdoor unit. Now, typically, this is, and this is at our facility. So, so let me start walking through, and, and I, Ian, that's, it's a really, it's a great question. Are they UL listed agents and foams? It all depends. We're agnostic on what we use. We're going to use the best, best foam or encapsulator agent that's on the market. Um, the, the product that we use is F500. Um, they are not UL listed. He hasn't gone down the path of really testing that. But at the same time, it's not a foam, right? It's, a, it's actually considered a wetting agent under NFPA rules. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that. And it's a great question. I'm happy to take that offline. Um, and I'm happy to connect you with, you know, with the experts in it. But the, uh, so basically the difference of an encapsulator agent versus a foam and this is one of the things that you'll see when we're fighting lithium ion batteries. The reason we prefer the wetting agent is that with a foam fire or with, with a foam, you're blanketing a fire and you're trying to starve it of oxygen. And what happens is when you're dealing with a lithium ion battery that creates its own oxygen, you really have to soak it, right, to get it to, to stop burning. So what ends up or, or it burns itself out. So you can use a foam and it can work as long as you have enough of that foam that you're actually really, uh, you know, soaking it. Um, with our encapsulator agent, it puts a reverse polarity around the uh, water molecule. So what ends up happening is that with the foam, the radiant heat will steam off because it's still considered a water molecule, where the encapsulator agent will actually work like a Pac-Man and cool. So that's where that's why we prefer it for lithium-ion battery fires. And I mean, it works for A, uh, A, B, and, and D fires. Um, this is a tip floor that, um, that basically there was a fire on the front. Um, there was actually two fires here. One was in the uh, infeed, and one was um, embers actually popped off onto the, um, you know, into the tip floor. But what you're going to see, and I think this is really important, I mean, th the smoke really started quickly, right? Um, and that's the thing. These 40-foot buildings, they fill up with smoke. So, you know, you might have all these plans in a fire prevention plan. But that's where I talk about evacuation, right? Your people should not be fighting this fire within the first two minutes of a fire really happening. And maybe it's less than two minutes, right? Um, now, this is actually a human agent. One of our agents is looking at this. This is our thermal camera. We hit the front, and then we're going to move it into the second, you know, inside the infeed, um, and we put the fire out. So the other thing, what's nice about our system, we, we've used three to four percent of the tank at this point, right? Um, you know, we can shoot for eight to twelve minutes of full blast, and that's conservative number. Um, now, the beauty of our system is it doesn't reset. There's no false alarms. It doesn't reset. 
So what we end up having is we will see that it goes back to control to normal. And when it goes back to control at normal, that means I mean, we're basically a built-in firewall. Um, so this is one of our systems that is, so what you're seeing here is it's a thermal camera and the fire rover units behind it, but this is on an infeed. And typically what we're doing is, you know, we are basically alarming any time that there is a heat abnormality that gets to a certain level that we've set at about 220 degrees, they need to shut down their system. So if they shut it down, they can remove the obstruction. So let's just say someone put a chain link fence in for some freaking reason, but you know, hoses, other things, they get in there constantly. And what's happening is you think of a car when it's running without oil, you know, if you could stop it before it runs out of oil, you're okay. But when you, once it runs out of oil, everything melts together. This is very, very, very similar, right? So the idea is, is that we're watching to make sure that this doesn't happen. Now here, there's a fire. And when there's a fire, we have another thermal camera that is remotely or strategically placed at the top of the conveyor system because you want these these fires to be contained to one specific area. Um, you know, we've had, I don't know how many in the past. So here you're going to see the conveyor. It sees the fire. It shuts down the entire operation. Okay. Then we go back and, and what you're going to see in this, in this um, specific situation, this is we're charging our tank with nitrogen, right? Remotely operated. This is being watched. I mean, we have a heartbeat with our system. So we know what's happening at any time, at any second. Now that big smoke, what happened here is that two of the employees got up and actually sprayed it, okay? Which again, I don't believe in fire extinguishers, right? The reason I don't believe in fire extinguishers is because you have to be six feet in front and you have to spray it and you're putting yourself at risk. You're smelling all the noxious fumes and we don't know what's in there. So again, had we been able to just shoot this and not wait while they were putting the two fire extinguishers on there, not to mention these guys got into a loader I don't know from a safety perspective if that's a good, bad, or, you know, but my assumption is it's not a good thing, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to start shooting it now. Now that it's a major fire, unfortunately, you know, we should have been shooting it two minutes ago in this specific case, but we'll put this fire out within like about a minute. And um, we do have built in fire watch. Um, so again, if it started up again, we'd be able to put this out. So let me actually, uh, so th is there a rough customer cost for an outside system or is a customer spec and site specific? Sam, great question. Um, we can talk through that on, offline. I mean, you know, the, uh, I don't really want to get into cost here, but I think we'll, um, you know, we can, we can talk about that offline if you want. Um, now, another question with your self-contained system, have you ever encountered a fire uh, where the thousand gallons was not enough? And the answer to you is, um, great question. Um, this was a rubber fire that we put out. Okay. So we actually had a 3000 degree rubber fire out in four and a half minutes. It's still at 40% left of the tank. Um, you know, this is 3000 degree fire, 361 chemicals. And what you're going to see here is that we have this fire. We're going to start shooting it. It was deep seated. I mean, typically rubber fires are bad, right? Um, they can last days. Um, we had this out. We also sprayed the side of the building. So we sprayed the collateral assets. Um, and we're going to continuously spray and we'll have this out. We still have 40% left of our tank. So, you know, and again, I'll go through this quickly. I mean, this is actually on YouTube. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, we'll have this out. The answer is um, there's one here that we did have. Uh, that and we do a ton of hazard material. We had one, I believe it's in here, where we put it out. The fire department got there. Uh, this is a lithium ion battery explosion. So uh, I'm going to get back to your question. Again, you saw that little lithium ion battery. It's sitting on top of tip floor. It explodes. Middle of night, no one's there. We hit it, put it out. You know, we'll call the fire department if we need to, or we'll call the general manager if there's a security guard there. But again, we have this thing out before it turns into anything major. Um, there's one that I want to show. I'm actually going to pull up YouTube. Can you guys see the YouTube? Is everybody doing this? So if you go to our YouTube channel, and again, um, feel free to subscribe if you'd like. Fire uh, World's only and that's not so this is the one i actually took a 10 minute video this actually happened two weeks ago but i took a 10 minute video and watch how fast this goes 
right? This was a deep seated fire. We shot this all the way through the entire tank. And again, what's nice is with the, with the uh, F500, what we're doing is we're soaking the area so that it can't like start a fire after. So at a certain point, you'll see with some of these deep seated fires, you know, we're going to spray and soak them and basically uh, pre wet them. Okay, so it went black. So someone here, let me. Uh, uh, I will have it again. Let me give you screen, and I'm showing you. Here's the fire rover one. So you should be able to see this now. Um, can you see it now? See the video? No. No. Okay. Uh, yes. Melanie just said yes. Can you now see it? No, no, no. All right, let's try this one more time because it's, ooh, that's why. Okay. So share screen, screen, and I'm going to show you guys this one. Share. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so this was a 10 minute video that happened. It shows kind of, how fast we're going through these, right? But this was a transfer station. This just happened 11 days ago. You know, again, these are what, this is the fear that I'm seeing based on what we have seen. And again, it's not just this one. We have a bunch of different ones, right? But, you know, this was one that I thought made a lot of sense. And again, we used the entire tank. Um, we also have a backup inside the tank. Um, so that's there, but you see the loader, we're talking to the loader operator on these and we're making sure like, you know, this is there's a communication protocol between us and our customer so we're constantly working through this and you know again this is down to a minute but you'll see they start to pull these out and we're still watching while we're on the phone with them so if it did start over again we would be able to either shoot or the fire department would be on scene again at this point most of the time when you pre-wet one of the biggest mistakes that that waste companies make is that they 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 see a fire and they go to to um and they go to unload it, right? Like ASAP. So here, hold on. You're going to see, I'm going to go back to the, another screen and I will get back to this one. And again, feel free to go to Fire Rover, um, our, our YouTube page, or if you go to Fire Rover backslash demos, um, you know, we will, um, we will, you know, we have a lot of these videos, the ones that our customers allow us to share. We have some customers that love when we share, and we have some customers that don't. So, Andy, I think to answer your question as well, this one, we, this was another fire that, again, they, they use an extinguisher. Um, we actually shot the entire tank here. We had the fire out before the fire department arrived, but the fire department, when they arrived, they actually put a, uh, a, a containment hose. So they just kept basically pre-wetting it. And, again, the beauty is, is that we still have, um, fire watch. So we're still watching it and we can still see if there's a flare up or a, a spark. Um, we have our guys on site that will come out and refill these typically within 24 hours. Um, but I mean, in, in specific cases, if we need to sooner, we can typically do it depending on the time of the day. So you'll see this one goes on for a while. Um, I did speed this one up as well. But you know, what you'll see is at the very end, I mean, this, you know, a lot of these fires, they start low and, you know, you got to get in and go at them and go at them. And, and just to give you guys an example of, of how targeted our spray is, I mean, this is an example of a hazard material, one of our hazard material facilities. And um, so you'll see, like, there's the fifth pallet is a chemical that's been mislabeled. This is an indoor outdoor storage operation. It's uh, hazard materials. And, you know, again, with hazard materials, this is, we have two different solutions for hazard materials. This one, what you're going to see is we're going to shoot this environmentally friendly, no cleanup. We're talking to the, uh, to the operator on the floor. Um, you'll see he'll actually have a bunny suit, so he'll be walking over. In the old days, you would have a forklift operator that would basically pull this out and take risk of it exploding on them, right? Um, and you see he's right here. So... The beauty is watch this with the thermal monitor. You can see really how targeted our spray is. So again, this is human control, right? So even in the middle of smoke, in the middle of the night, I mean, we are controlling this from a, uh, a remote operation where we're obviously safe. So, 
you know, basically it's a, a smart robot. Um, and you see, I mean, we're hitting the fifth pallet and then we can see that there's no more heat, um, you know, heat coming off of it. So we say, okay, now it's safe for you to go take this and you'll see, they'll pull the forklift out. They'll start to remove each one and then they'll, they'll take that one unit and take it out to, uh, you know, some sort of to segregate it, you know, to take care of it in a, uh, in a responsible way. Um, we do a ton of outdoor operations as well. Like, so, so actually this dusty operation, um, this is, a this is what I was saying with the, with the, um, hazard material, this, you know, when we're, when we're fighting these or we're working with these, it's not, they're basically using an element of heat to, to recycle the, these chemicals, right? So what we're doing, I mean, when they're closed down, we have no risk of fire, but you'll see in here, they get dusty operation. When there's a fire, if it goes out of, out of spec, so if it hits, I think, 400 degrees, we'll start to shoot it. But again, you know, we're working in locations that are, uh, you know, are, are very smoky. You can barely see. And again, you know, they, these are, are just some of the things we do on a daily basis. You know, it's, it's kind of a, it impresses me even looking at it. And, uh, you know, I've seen it for years, right? So. I think the other thing too, I mean, this is an outdoor operation. This is a, there's a shredder that, that occurred there. This fire had happened two years in a row in the same location. Um, you know, this is an outdoor uh, fire, you know, half of our facilities are outdoors. We have over 150 locations. So um, I think we're getting to that point. So, uh, you know, a ton of different applications out there, all the different, uh, you know, th these are, different things that we can share. We do specialized hazards. Um, you know, this is what it's gonna look like when we do designs. So, you know, we go in and we basically look at, at Google Earth. I mean, I think this is another thing, which is our enforcers. These are our fire brigade tools. And what's nice about these is, and I'll show you our 60 when we're, when we're shooting it. But what's nice about these is that, you know, you have four to six minutes that you can shoot for. We can use the throw nozzle. We have a 10 and a 60. And what's really nice about these is when the fire department comes on scene, if you only have a thermal detection and, you know, so we do a thermal only where we'll tell you that there's a fire, um, you know, if you only have a thermal detection and you have this ready, the fire department comes on scene and can fight the fire right away. Or your employees can fight the fire from 45, 50 feet, a safe distance away versus, you know, when they're fighting these fires with a, you know, something like a fire extinguisher that they need to be six feet away and it lasts for, you know, 30 seconds, if that. Um, you know, just to give, you know, we've won some awards. I mean, I don't know if that's important. Um, you know, and obviously we have a, a pretty good waste and recycling kind of customer base. But with that, I mean, you know, I do have the annual report that's out as well. So, you know, if you guys want a copy of that report, it's on LinkedIn and I'm happy to, happy to share uh, with that as well. But with that being said, if you guys got anything else that you want to discuss, any questions or anything, um, if not, I mean, I definitely understand it's been an hour. So if you guys want to drop off, thank you so much for joining. Um, but I will, uh, I will, uh, you know, one thing I think Susie just mentioned to me, which I think is great, is that EREF is doing a fire survey, um, which is really nice for, um, we're basically trying to figure out how many fires are happening in all these uh, facilities. And so, you know, we are co-sponsoring it. Um, we're, we're actually going to integrate um, the, like my reported data in and some other data. And, uh, you know, so feel free to, um, to take care of that assessment. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely something we need everybody's support because the last thing we want to see is someone saying, hey, you know, this, you know, ours weren't included. So, you know, 20 of our MERS weren't included, which means that this isn't statistically significant. Anything else that we see, Andy? Can't wait to see you in New Orleans, guys. Anything else? Thank you for all the You're pretty optimistic about New Orleans. Hey, Matt. What'd you say? You're pretty optimistic about New Orleans happening. I mean, I'm not. Op I mean, I'm an optimistic person, right? So, really, at the end of the day, I have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, I think that New Orleans probably will happen. My my gut tells me that uh, you know. And if you want to see it, I've been using this uh, this tool that is a COVID nineteen tool. So this is actually pretty cool. Um, if you guys haven't seen this, it's uh, it's run by IHME, um, but it has all the projections and all the dates. So what's cool is from the United States, it kind of shows uh, the peak, 
and then you know what they think the peak obviously it's kind of morbid but deaths per day that they're peaking so you know you can go in if we look at i, I know louisiana is a, a hotbed right now but we can go to louisiana and their peak's supposed to be in seven days so if it looks from their numbers i mean we're clear sailing once we hit you know may june July, or in sorry once we hit august so um you know, if, if for some reason the world is not back by August, we're probably in a lot more trouble. So. Cool. Any other questions or anything? I mean, I see a lot of people are still on, so maybe you're just on and turned it on for, I mean, you don't get credit for being on this, so. Um. All right. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate it. I'm available. If you need anything, I'll leave this up for a little bit. Um, again, if you have any questions or want to reach out to me after, feel free. Um, will the recorded be safe somewhere? Jennifer, I will do my best. I am recording this. Um, I will do my best to share it. So i um, never done that before. Um, you know, Chris was helping me kind of walk through this, Christopher Newman, and I appreciate Chris inviting everybody uh, from your jurisdictions in. So I will do my best to record it, but I'm also, I'm planning to do this each Thursday. Um, so I'll, I'll for sure do it next Thursday as well, if you know of anybody and uh, happy to share this with you, um, at least the presentation um, as well. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Thomas. I appreciate you being on.